Chapter 48. An, please like, subscribe, and comment. It really helps my motivation to continue writing this story. Chapter 48. A time for us, at last to see. A life worthwhile for you and me. And with our love, through tears and thorns. We will endure as we pass surely through every storm. The song cut off on his phone as a ringing started blaring in his suit's earpieces, effectively shattering the calm disposition that he finally had been able to achieve by hearing Mary Jane's voice. The feeling of unease now settled deep in his chest, the spell of the song now broken but not altogether lost. The remnants of her siren tune still lingered inside of him. One of his demands of fury had been that he be allowed to use one of their computers to upload Mary Jane's song to his new phone from the CD Annabelle had gifted him. Ever since, he listened to it constantly every time he was out scoping the Venice streets. In an odd way, despite blocking out the noise of the city that he should be paying attention to, listening to the song kept him focused, as it also drowned out the ever-threatening disquiet blaring in his head. Landing in a perch on top of a tower's pillar, Peter paused and allowed himself to release a heavy sigh as the ringing phone continued its incessant bellowing. He knew without answering how this conversation was going to go. He was being summoned by fury. Gritting his teeth one last time, Peter accepted the call. Hello? Be at the base in fifteen minutes. Was the only greeting that he got. Ah, can you go without me for just a few more hours? He had hoped to be able to search for Mary Jane at least until daybreak, looking at the time on his phone, it wasn't even close to midnight yet. No. There is information in the plan that you should be privy to. The line then disconnected and Peter threw his head back and groaned, just barely fighting back the urge to scream. It was in moments like this where Peter seriously regretted joining Fury's mission. It's been two days since their renegotiation and where Peter finally accepted Fury's terms. Sure, there were perks to it, but they were difficult for him to remember every time he was interrupted from his first mission to go and join the other. But he couldn't deny how nice it was to be upgraded to the five-star hotel suite rather than staying in the hostel, yes, he barely spent any time there but the few hours of sleep that he allowed himself on the downy mattress were heavenly and rejuvenated his body so that it was fighting ready. Fury had also kept his word and had a designer supply him with a new covert black suit. It wasn't all that high-tech but it got the job done by concealing his identity. Beck was right when he mentioned that it was reckless of Peter to go around in his iconic red and blue ensemble. He couldn't risk being recognized before he found Mary Jane. There was also comfort in the knowledge that he wasn't the only one looking for Mary Jane. On top of EDITH, who he had programmed to do a continuous search for any sign of facial recognition for Mary Jane, he now had an entire team of operatives at his disposal. Only. It had been two days. He would have thought that they'd have found Mary Jane by now. The fact that they didn't left him in a seemingly endless state of restlessness as turmoil brewed just underneath the surface. All that he wanted to do was spend every spare moment that he had searching every nook and cranny that Venice had to offer, but he was constantly being interrupted at every turn by Fury's phone calls. He was honestly demanding too much of Peter's time, when he knew expressly how much Peter needed to find Mary Jane. It was almost to the point where Peter was starting to suspect that it was all deliberate, that he was purposefully trying to keep Peter busy so that he would give up on his pursuit of Mary Jane. When these thoughts had first entered his mind, he thought them to be ridiculous. Why would Fury have any reason to do that? He didn't even know Mary Jane, so why would he want to keep Peter from finding her? He shouldn't have any sort of grudge against her, right? But as the days passed, his suspicions only grew. Perhaps Fury's reasons to distract Peter had less to do with Mary Jane and more to do with Peter himself. There were many reasons as to why Peter thought this could be true. Among them were so that Peter's mind would fixate on defeating the elementals only, because Fury saw Mary Jane as a distraction. He also surmised that Fury was trying out his reach when it came to Peter, to see how far he could take it whenever he gave commands without Peter putting up any sort of fight. It was becoming abundantly clear that Fury wanted Peter to take orders from him, to build a new Avengers team with Fury at the helm, controlling it all. At least, that theory was becoming more and more plausible to Peter with each passing day. He hadn't mentioned any of this to Fury yet, but the canal towards the confrontation was certainly reaching its boiling point. For now, he would return to base. He couldn't risk compromising the opportunity of maintaining the team of operatives with his temper by making Fury well, furious. The team of operatives was what Fury was using to hold over Peter's head. So, Peter would swallow any remaining pride that he had for Mary Jane's sake. 
he play along with Fury for now, until he got a better grasp on the situation at hand. With that, he swung through the night sky, the city lights below his feet as he made his way to the underground bunker where SHEILD was running its operations. Where's Mr. Beck? Peter asked as soon as he entered the room full of holograms and monitors, noticing immediately that the man of stature was nowhere to be seen. Mr. Beck was his only saving grace throughout this whole operation. He was the only one that was sensitive enough to take Peter's feelings and stress into account. And beyond that, he was just someone that Peter enjoyed having around. If he was going to be stuck here, he at least wanted someone there that he felt he could talk to. They have spoken extensively about the differences between their universes whenever they had the chance, which wasn't very often as Fury tended to take up most of Peter's time. And whenever he wasn't, Peter always made a point of leaving, continuing his mission of finding Mary Jane. Mr. Beck solemnly swore that he understood one time before Peter vacated the underground room, but there was still that underlying guilt that Peter felt in that he couldn't do more to help the man. But it couldn't be helped. Mary Jane came first. He's been working for hours so he finally went to get some shut-eye, Fury's tone was almost accusatory as he glanced back at Peter from his seat in front of a monitor. His implication was clear, that Mr. Beck was going above and beyond while Peter was slacking. Why am I here if he's not, then? It didn't make sense. If Peter was going to be here, then realistically, Beck should be here too. Whenever they go over the plans, they should be coordinating together. He didn't begrudge the man for needing sleep, hell. Peter felt like he could sleep for days if he allowed himself the pleasure, but he was rather bothered by the fact that Fury had summoned him while knowing that Mr. Beck was away. Honestly, what more was there to cover without Beck's input? He was the expert when it came to the elementals, after all. Because we need to go over the intel one more time, Fury responded, his tone bridging for no argument as he turned in his swivel chair to give Peter a look, almost daring Peter for his defiance. Peter's mind balked as he could only gawk open mouthed at him for a few seconds. W. We've been over the intel countless times. I can't just. creak. crash. Peter's voice broke off as the sound of scraping metal being ripped apart resounded sickeningly from down the hall, reminiscent of nails running down the surface of a chalkboard. In an instant, all of the agents were on their feet, weapons drawn as they ran for the hall. Peter pulled on the mask to his black suit, preserving his identity as he ran to join the fray, only to come to an immediate halt behind the wall of agents as he witnessed the remainder of the metal security door that led to the outside world getting torn with. Molten man standing in the severed wreckage of the opening. The golden metallic skin was immediately recognizable to Peter, even though he technically hasn't seen it in over five years. His frantic eyes did a sweep of the man's body, looking for any sign of steam or flames, and was relieved to find that neither was in sight. All guns were drawn on the intruder but Mark didn't seem to be bothered in the slightest. As soon as his gaze connected with Peter's masked face, he stalked forward in righteous fury. What the fuck are you doing here, punk? Stand down or we will open fire? Maria Hill shouted, hidden behind her pointed gun as her voice was shrouded with seriousness to a deadly degree. Wait, don't, Peter cried to the group of agents at large tearing off his mask as he stumbled forward to put himself between the agents and Molten Man. He couldn't just let Mary Jane's father die, not like this. The image of her crying over him the night of his capture wouldn't leave Peter's mind. Yes, they had a rocky relationship, some may even call it non-existent, but she would be devastated to learn that he died. Especially if she learned that Peter did nothing to stop it. No. He couldn't do that to her. Peter held his arms up in what he hoped was a placating manner, now firmly standing in the way of their guns. He's here for me. He, he, Peter cut himself off as hot hands whirled him around and grabbed at the front of his suit, managing to bunch the tight fabric as Mark lifted Peter up in the air. He was only fortunate enough that Mark wasn't hot enough to actually burn right then, though the proximity to his heat immediately had Peter sweating. Why aren't you out there searching for my daughter like you're supposed to? Mr. Watson seethed through his teeth as he pulled Peter uncomfortably close, to the point where the tips of their noses were practically touching. Why aren't you in Rome? Peter countered before he cringed. It probably wasn't the smartest thing to ask in an accusatory manner rather than attempting to explain the situation to the man. It sounded like Peter was trying to deflect the question, which could only result in antagonizing Molten Man further. I was searching Rome. Just like you said, Peter could feel Molten Man's hot breath on his cheek. 
He wanted to turn away so badly in order to escape it but he couldn't help but think that it would also show signs of weakness. But then I thought, why should I trust you? I doubt that she is even in Rome and you only wanted me out of the way. That wasn't an unfair assumption. That was exactly what Peter had wanted, Mark Watson out of the way. But he hadn't lied to Mr. Watson when he sent him to Rome, he really did think that there was a slim chance of her being there. He opened his mouth to explain himself, but Mark continued on before he had the chance. But I thought that at the very least, you would still be searching for her here. Only I come back to Venice to find that you are playing spy with S-H-E-I-L-D. Peter squirmed against the hold, trying to break it without tearing the fabric of his black suit. How do you know that? I told you, Mark sneered, clenching his fist in a tighter grip, shaking his hold so that Peter was jostled around in a threatening manner. I work for General Ross now. I've crossed paths with many S-H-E-I-L-D agents over the years. I know how they operate. But that is beside the point, you are slacking on the job. The accusation rang firm and clear as it reverberated throughout his mind. He knew that it wasn't necessarily true. He was doing all that he could for Mary Jane, what was best for her. You don't know that. Peter stressed, every spare moment I have, I'm out there looking for her. Every spare moment? Mark seethed as he interrupted. There was a wave of steam that Peter could see wafting off of the man's metallic back, he was reaching a boiling point. You should be devoting every second to Mary Jane? You don't understand, Peter was unsure as to why he felt the need to defend himself against the man before him. Perhaps because Mark's words were eating away at the part of Peter that felt that no matter what he did, it would never be enough. It was like Mark Watson's words were manifesting Peter's innermost thoughts in real time. I wasn't given much of a choice. Deary offered me a team of operatives too. Kindly drop Mr. Parker and step away, Mr. Watson, Fury said as he finally came into the hall, cutting off Peter's explanation. In his hands was a large blasting gun, something that may actually do a bit of damage to Mr. Watson's metallic skin. Mark eyed the weapon over Peter's shoulder with a slight amount of wariness. Then his gaze slowly drifted back to connect with Peter's, the depths of which did a poor job of masking the hint of betrayal directed Peter's way. I can't believe that I trusted you, Mr. Watson finally hissed, his voice thick as tears started to well in his eyes, shocking Peter to his core. He was crying? Peter didn't think that he had the ability to care in that way. You can. Peter stressed, for some reason unknown to him, he wanted the man to understand. He wanted him to see how much the last several days had been hell for Peter, plaguing him with taunting thoughts of Mary Jane in peril, all while he hasn't yet come to terms with Mr. Stark's death. Peter wanted Mr. Watson to understand how taxing the political game he was playing with Fury actually was, but also how it was all best for Mary Jane in the end. I've been doing all that I can to find her. You're not doing nearly enough, Mark choked on a broken sob that caught in his throat. He dropped Peter then, who landed nimbly on his feet. Mark then turned and started stalking away down the hall. Where are you going? Peter called after him. He didn't get a response. Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson didn't even so much as glance back. Mark. Mark disappeared through the gaping hole that he previously made in the metal doorway, disappearing into the night. A quick succession of rapid rasping sounds filled the room. It took a moment to realize that it was actually coming from himself. Peter was hyperventilating, unable to get a breath deep enough in his lungs. I've got to go after him, he gasped out desperately to himself as his hands clenched frantically around his black mask. He can't find Mary Jane first. He, they're not going anywhere, Fury cut off his tirade, his voice entirely calm. Stiffening where he stood, Peter turned slowly to look back at him, watching as the director of SHEILD handed off the blasting gun to another agent. Fury then took several steps forward so that he stood over him, using his height to his advantage as he poked at Peter's chest with severity. Your responsibility is here, Mr. Parker. B but I can't just let him. My team is already working on locating her, Fury retracted his hand and crossed his arms over his chest, his look imposing. Unless you want to terminate their services, I suggest you get back to work here. There it was. An outright threat this time rather than it just being an underlying suggestion. His suspicions hadn't been so crazy, after all. Fury sought to control Peter through means of threats and leverage. His entire body shook with the underlying rage that was boiling just beneath the surface of his skin. He could feel it seeping deep within his bones. He had to get away, 
before he did something that he would regret. Because the desire to tear something apart with his bare hands was suddenly upon him. I need a moment, he said, flat and through clenched teeth. And without waiting for an answer, Peter turned and stormed down the long hall and out the gaping hole for a door. Mark Watson was nowhere in sight, long gone now. Immediately, he turned and rammed his fists into the concrete wall underneath the bridge, leaving an impressive dent as dust burst out from the impact. It didn't make him feel any better. He wasn't sure why he thought it would. Peter released a shuddering breath as he collapsed to his knees, both hands coming up to tangle in his hair, desperately needing something to hold on to. Everything was wrong. Nothing was going right. His singular goal of finding Mary Jane, which he had once foolishly thought was straightforward, had twisted and branched out so that it more resembled a knotted web. There were so many moving parts that Peter felt it too difficult to keep up. He was out of his depth. He could just leave. Right now. Without saying a word to Fury. But how long would it take for Fury to notice Peter's lack of return and pull back his men from finding Mary Jane? What if they were currently on the cusp of her discovery and Peter's decision to set out on his own would tamper with that? He felt so lost. Like he was at a fork in the road without a map to guide him. The only question that he had was, which road should he choose to take? He feared that even if he had an answer, it would prove to be the wrong one. More than anything, he wished that he could call Mr. Stark right then. To ask for his advice, for his help and guidance. He knew with the utmost certainty that if Mr. Stark were alive and well today, then Mary Jane would have already been found. Iron Man was a true hero like that. An hour passed as he weighed his options. Debating in his mind which course of action was the best to take. Then he sighed and hung his head. If there was one thing that he knew for certain, it was that he was essentially useless on his own. It was shameful. Because he was Spider-Man. He had all of these abilities but he still was unsure of how to apply them correctly. What good were these powers if he couldn't even use them to find Mary Jane? Never before had he ever felt like such a fraud. A failure. A curse. With that thought echoing in his mind, Peter stood onto shaky legs and wiped at his eyes, only now just realizing that silent tears had fallen onto his cheeks. Without lingering any further, he turned and slowly put one foot inside through the gaping hole, followed by the other, making his way to return to Fury's side. Scuffing his boots with his every step down the long hallway, Peter dallied his way through, not at all eager to face Fury after what had occurred with Mark and afterward. He didn't think that he could handle seeing the judgment cast his way from that singular eye. But still, he trudged forward all the same. As he approached an open door off of the main hallway, he noticed that light and voices emanated from within, echoing out into the hall. Hey Grant, Victor haven't seen you in a couple of days, one gruff voice said. There were noises in the background. A spoon clinking against a ceramic mug. The sound of a microwave running as it worked to heat up food. They must be in a break room of sorts. Hiya, Jerry, one of the other voices returned the greeting, seeping with a lazy lilt to his tone that came out in a bit of a drawl, followed by a languid sip of liquid that must have been from that mug. Aren't you guys supposed to be out searching for the Watson girl? The first, deep voice asked. Peter froze. Halting completely in his tracks just outside of the open door, still hidden from sight. A derisive snort burst out of the third person in the room. Why bother? It's been five years. She's most likely dead right now. Poor kid is delusional. The world tilted on its axis. His vision swam as he became dizzy. Pounding ached in his head, as though his skull was too tightly pressed against his brain. Peter stumbled backward, nearly falling until he ran into something firm. He turned his head back, out of reflex, and saw that he ran into Mr. Beck, dressed in his ornate armor as though ready for battle. Judging by the look on his face, with the distinct downturn of his lips and the hard look in his eyes, he had heard everything as well. Without a word, he grabbed Peter by the elbow and began to tuck him away, back toward the gaping hole that led to the outside. But once there, they didn't stop. Mr. Beck didn't let go until they were far enough away, standing on top of the bridge that covered the hidden doorway from the notice of the public. His breaths were coming out in rapid pants as he fought against the sensation to hurl up the contents of his stomach. Running to the edge of the bridge, Peter leaned over it as he fought for control over his body's reactions. Mr. Beck followed him, cautious and slow, as though he were approaching a frightened animal and was afraid that any abrupt movements would spook him. When most of the nausea subsided, 
Peter pushed off of the ledge of the bridge and turned to face Mr. Beck. I never should have trusted Fury. Peter ranted with tears escaping his eyes against his will. Both of his hands were knotted in his hair as he began to pace in front of the man. I've wasted so much time. Mr. Beck winced as he witnessed Peter's display. There was a deep level of pity displayed in his expression, and also a measurable amount of guilt. Though Peter didn't blame him, Beck had been the one to convince Peter to join Fury's mission. I wouldn't put too much blame on Fury, Mr. Beck said, his voice careful as he held up his hands in an attempt to pacify him, he probably has no clue that his agents are slacking on the job. His words were far from comforting for Peter that all he could do was ignore them. Instead, he stopped abruptly, mid-pace, and turned to face Mr. Beck. I've got to leave. Peter rambled as he wiped hastily at his cheeks. I've got to find her. I, calm down, kid. Mr. Beck interrupted as he took a couple of cautious steps forward, take a deep breath. You can't just go out there aimlessly wandering the city without a game plan. That would be just as much time wasted as you spending time here. Squeezing his eyes shut, Peter willed for the words to not make that much sense. Because if they were true, then what was there for Peter to do? Taking Mysterio's first advice, Peter forced himself to inhale deeply before he released the breath out in a shaky staccato. Slowly, he opened his eyes. Then what do you suggest? He was open to any recommendations at this point. So long as he got the desired outcome of having Mary Jane Watson safe in his arms once again. Mr. Beck paused and hesitated, almost as though he hadn't really thought this far to actually propose any sort of instruction for Peter to follow. Did he see how hopeless it was then, too? I heard that her father was here, right? Mr. Beck began, his voice starting out weak but gained with confidence the longer that he spoke. Work with him and... You don't understand, Peter interrupted, vetoing the idea completely before it even had the chance to come to fruition. I don't trust him. He's tried to kidnap her before. He claims that he's changed but I can't risk the chance of him finding her first, I... Bing. 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 Peter cut himself off by the ringing beep that was coming from the hidden compartment in his black suit. Releasing a huff of frustration, he thought that it was perhaps his new phone that had set off the noise. Probably Fury wondering where he was and demanding his presence once again. Well, Peter had plenty to say to the man, and the first words he planned to say started with, fuck off. Peter reached into the hidden compartment, his mounting irritation making it difficult for him to grasp at the object. Only, when he pulled his hand out, it was for him to produce EDITH out in the open air. The lenses were blinking with a dull bluish hue as they continued to beep incessantly at him. Peter could only stare at the glasses he had in hand in mild confusion. EDITH was sending him a signal.